Okay, so we're back. And if you look at the last pages of the syllabus, it has tape one checklist. And then after that, it has an evaluation for tape one. And it has the same thing for tape two and tape three. So this is the checklist we're going to follow for tape one. And um, I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to remove some things because I want it to fit into 30 minutes. Um, but that's fine. Uh, but we're going to begin talking about some of these things tonight. And then we're going to finish. Uh, we're going to spend more time on them next week. Uh, and we're going to finish this checklist. And then we're going to practice some of them a little bit. So um, I also, on D2L, there are some notes uh, that um, I, I had a graduate assistant who took this course, and they took notes for everybody and typed them up, and I posted them on D2L. Uh, so they're basic, they're not my notes, but I think it does cover what they thought was important as a student to know from these checklists. So you can access them on D2L, they're posted already, um, just, uh, just for your information. So when we start talking about um, counseling sessions. I think that one of the um, one of the things not a lot of professors talk about is the act of being present for another person. So when we think about this, how many times in your life or how many relationships do you have? when somebody is actually present for you. They're not thinking about something else. They're not looking at a cell phone. They're not watching TV. You know, nothing else is going on. They're giving you their full attention. It doesn't happen very often in life anymore. We have a lot of distractions. Or if it's not like, looking at a cell phone or social media or having the TV playing in the background, it may be that we're very concerned in our minds with either something that happened in the past, maybe something that happened before the session or even longer in the past, and we're thinking about that, or we're worried about something we have to do after the session, after work the next day, or we're worried about some anxiety producing possibility in the future. Now, if people are thinking about the past, a lot of times it includes regrets if they're a client, so if they're talking a lot about the past, and that leads to depression. If people are worried about the future, the unknown, what might happen, that leads to anxiety. But the place where the person is not, and that's the present. So we can't do anything about the past. We can't do anything about the future. Yeah, we might try to make amends or change something or prepare, but ultimately we really only have the present moment. But our minds are very rarely focused on the present. Our minds are usually very busy thinking about other things. When you go into a session with a client, I go when I go into a session with a client, I usually remind myself to kind of focus my thoughts in the present and to be present for the client, the other person. Now, one of the interesting things 
is that when we begin to do this in our sessions and it becomes a habit, we also begin to do it in our lives. And that makes a big difference with all our relationships, not only our significant others or our family or our friends, but people we just meet. People are not used to really getting all of somebody's attention. They're not used to having somebody truly be present for them. Uh, it's one of the things that reminds me of like Mr. Rogers, the television show, the way he was with kids. He wasn't thinking about anything else. He was simply present for them. That's what made it such a great show. That's why children responded. But you know what? Adults need the same thing. We might not both voice it, but it's usually something that's missing in our lives. It's something that's very important. And it's something that we have to practice doing. It doesn't happen automatically because for, for most of our lives, it's not how we've lived. So I think the most important thing to begin with is to try to center ourselves, to remind ourselves to be not only present, but mindful of the client. With that being said, we begin to think about things like over 50% of what we communicate with other people, clients or not, is through body language. And over 50% of the body language is simply through facial expressions. So it's important to kind of be aware of our own body language, of our own facial expressions with our clients. Now, one thing that I don't like is when a lot of psychologists and psychology courses teach people that they do not want to show an emotional response to the client. They're almost deadpan. I don't think that's genuine. I think it's acceptable to have an emotional response to a client as long as it is appropriate. You know, I'm not going to laugh at a client, but as we build trust, I can laugh with a client and there's a big difference. So, um, you know, I think it's important to have a genuine response to a client, as long as it's an appropriate response, a respectful response. So it is important to think about how we're sitting, if we're being open, or if we are sitting another way, um, what our facial expression is, um, you know, when we think about our energy or our emotions, um, I think that one of the sayings I like is that the energy we exert is the energy we receive. A good example of this is like if we go to an interview, uh, if I'm anxious in an interview, I'm going to make the person interviewing me anxious. If I'm anxious as a therapist, that's going to make the client anxious. If I'm relaxed, it's going to help the other person to relax. If I have positive energy, it's going to share that positive energy with the other person. So in an interview... Uh, I know that if I got an interview, I'm qualified. They're not going to they're not going to ask me to go to an interview if I didn't meet their qualifications. So then, why interview me? Well, to find the best person for the job, but also they're going to be spending every day working with me. They want to know that that will be an enjoyable and helpful experience. So. By the end of the interview, I want to share stories. I want to get an emotional reaction. I want them to laugh a few times. And when I shake hands and say goodbye, I want them to think, you know, after a hard week of work, I could go have a beer with that guy. That's my goal for an interview. 
It's not, wow, that guy's really qualified and an expert in his field. It's who they want to spend time with. So that's very much like a counseling session. I want to be present. I want to have good body language. I want to share good energy with a client. Now, it's a little different with a client. The energy I want to share is positive when they're not sharing or positive when they're sharing something positive. But once they begin sharing with me, I want to share empathic energy, okay? So I want the client to realize that I'm doing my best to place myself in their shoes and to experience whatever emotion they're experiencing. I want to show empathy for what they're sharing with me. So if they're expressing sadness, I want to experience that same energy. If they're experiencing happiness, if they're experiencing whatever they're experiencing, I want to be empathic. So one of the interesting questions I always get is how do I experience a client's emotions empathically and not take it home with me or not get burnt out? Okay, so that whole concept is called detachment. So oftentimes people misunderstand the concept of a detachment. They think, oh, I'm going to separate myself from the client emotionally. I'm not going to experience these things. But in reality, detachment is the opposite. I'm going to fully experience as much of their emotion as I can I'm going to let that emotion flow through me, but I'm not going to own it. It's not my emotion. I'm going to experience, it's going to flow through me, and I'm going to let it go. And that's how we don't take those emotions home with us. It's how we don't end up getting burnt out. So I can experience empathy. I can experience their emotions, but I realize they're not mine. They're somebody else's. And so I don't own them, I don't hold on to them, I let them go. So I think that's one of the most important things. I also, and like I said previously, I don't go into a session with an agenda, unless there's something therapeutic, like if I need to do an assessment or something like that. But normally, I don't go in with a, an agenda. I see where the client is. I give the client the control. And I see what they have to share with me. And then I respond naturally using the skills that I've learned and see what happens. It's one of the hardest things for counselors to learn. It was well, a very hard thing for me to learn because I liked control. I liked being in control of my life because then I could predict success. If I was in control, I could predict a positive outcome. But that's not what counseling is about. So other things that we need to consider with clients is uh, our vocal tonality. How am I sounding? Am I talking fast? Am I talking uh, in a different pitch that might sound harsh? Am I talking too quiet? Am I too shy? What is my vocal tonality? Did I just experience something that I'm bringing into the session and I sound emotional? That's not matching the emotions of the client. So I keep track of my vocal tonality and pace. I also keep track of a client's vocal tonality and pace. Are they talking too fast? Are they talking very loud? Are they talking very softly? Are they harsh? Are they defensive? What is their tonality and pace? Are they bringing up a specific word or theme more than once repeatedly? So we begin to identify these things with the client. We wanna provide a safe environment for the client. 
We want a comfortable setting. We want positive energy. We want a safe environment. It doesn't mean that the client has to be comfortable emotionally, but it means they have to be safe enough that they can express a full range of emotions in the session. So safety is different than comfort level. So when we think about the list of skills that we're going to be using with a client or in our recorded sessions. The first thing, and people might not realize um, how to introduce ourselves. A lot of times people say, hey, I'm Grafton, how you doing? That seems like a normal thing. How you doing today? But we can't ask that with a client? What if they shared something that was confidential and we had to break confidentiality and report it? If we ask them how they're doing right off the bat and we didn't give them the limits of confidentiality, that could be a problem. So we cannot ask a client how they're doing. We have to be mindful of even how we introduce ourselves. So I usually say something like, hi, my name's Grafton. Uh, what would you like to be called? You know, they might they might have a name, you know, like Michael, and they want to be called Mike, or something totally different. Perhaps uh, they identify, uh, maybe their name's Michael, but they identify as a female, and their name is Michelle. So we have to be cognizant of these things, and I simply keep it open, and I ask them, what would you like to be called? And that leaves the control with them. Uh, even if their name is one thing on the intake, they might want to be called something completely different. So I don't assume anything. So once they introduce themselves, I say, have a seat. And then, uh, so even an introduction gets a little complicated. We have to think about these things. So then I say, before we begin the session, I'd like to go over a few uh, things like confidentiality, limits of confidentiality, things like that. And so I talk about confidentiality first, and I keep that simple. I never ask a client, do you know what confidentiality is? I don't want to put them on the spot. Maybe they don't. Why would I do that? So I never ask a client, do you know? I simply assume they don't. I wanna tell them what my interpretation of these things are. Now, when I have real clients in a private practice, all of this is written down on a piece of paper and they read it as I explain it to them. And then at the end, they acknowledge and sign that I've reviewed this with them. But we don't always have a piece of paper with us. So we do need to memorize confidentiality and the limits of confidentiality. So confidentiality, I simply say, uh, confidentiality is that I'm not going to share anything uh, that we talk about in this session uh, with anybody else unless uh, it meets one of the limits of confidentiality, and there are some limits. And they're mainly uh, either for your own safety, the safety of others, or uh, uh, a legal, uh, or by something that is binding legally. So basically, if we think about the limits of confidentiality, the most important one is that um, if, uh, you say something and I believe that you are a harm to yourself or others, uh, I'd have to, you know, break confidentiality for your own safety. Now, um, in my mind, that includes ab abuse. So uh, harm yourself, harm to others, or in harm's way, you could add, that would include abuse. But now most textbooks are including 
abuse as a separate limit to confidentiality. If you're experienced, especially for the elderly or minors, but um, so they usually include that and you can include it or you can say harm yourself for others or in danger in harm's way. Um, that would include it too. But you can include it as a second one. You know, if you're experiencing abuse in any way or in harm's way, I would need to uh, break confidentiality for your own safety. So that's only been within the last five or six years, and now most textbooks are including that. The next one is um, if a court subpoenas uh, my notes or requires me to appear in court, I'm mandated to do so. So that's the technical language of that. Um, and you should memorize the word subpoenaed and things like that. Um, sometimes I do say something like, um, I'll do my best uh, to advocate for you. I'll ask them things like, uh, can I submit a brief? Is there something specific that you're looking for that I could answer from my notes or records? Because in my mind, um, if, if there's some type of legal matter, um, it doesn't mean they have to know about a new relationship they're in or something like that. So I don't, I don't really like releasing things that are not pertinent to the case at hand. So I do try to ask the court these things, but half the time the court just says, no, nope, just send me all your records. And I mandated to do so. Um, I, if I am required to appear in court, um, I can choose how I'm going to answer questions you know, what I feel, how I want to answer specific questions. I always have to tell the truth, but I can answer it in different ways. Okay, the next thing is that um, if the client is a minor, and I, we don't need to get into different ages, it's different for different types of counseling in different settings, um, but if a client is a minor, and the parent or guardian, and you need both, if the parent or guardian requests the records, I'm also required to release those records. So that's the technical term for that. But I wanna add two things. The first thing is that um, even if a client is not a minor, I still say this. I say, I know you're not a minor, but if you were, I'd be required to release your records of a parent or guardian requested them. The reason I still say it, even with an adult, is because if I don't have that piece of paper and I have two months of only adults and then I get a child or a minor, I might forget to say that. So I keep saying it because I don't want to forget to say it when I do get a minor and I don't have a piece of paper. So it's kind of like a reminder to myself. I just always say the same thing. The other thing I say is that I kind of add my own thing to some of these. I say, but I'll definitely ask your parent or guardian to become part of the counseling process and to abide by the trust we've established in our confidential relationship. So I do talk with the parent or guardian if they request the records and I advocate for the client, but it doesn't always work, but I will do my best. The next one is um, right now, you'll say uh, I'm a student at Penn West and I do receive supervision to make sure that all clients receive the best care possible. And we discuss cases uh, with our supervisors and, um, and other students, but we, don't, we keep it uh, anonymous and we do not use your name. So that's kind of what you say 
as a student. Um, later on, when you graduate, even when you get your LPC, I usually say, I do discuss your case with the treatment team. I receive supervision so that you'll get the best care possible, but I keep your name anonymous or I keep it anonymous and I don't share your name. So it's a little different in a hospital setting because they do share the name. They know who we're talking about. But if I had an external uh, group, um, like if I had peer supervision or something like that, then I don't share the name. So it is a little different for certain settings like hospital settings. All right, that is, those are the limits of confidentiality that you'll need to memorize. And uh, I had to memorize them when I was a master's student. It's a pain, uh, but you do need to memorize them. All right, it's important also, people feel differently about one part of this list than the other. So if a person likes to be in control, they like the part that's memorized. They like this whole first section because they can memorize it. They're like, hey, I got it right, good to go. Or they feel good about the more impromptu section where they're using skills and they don't know what the client's going to bring up, but they know how to reflect, paraphrase, summarize, clarify. But it's a little more ambiguous. They don't have to memorize anything specifically. They react. So it really depends on your personality, which one you're going to feel more comfortable with. But you're going to feel more comfortable with one part of this than with another. So... The part you have to memorize, try not to like run through the memorized part like you're checking off a list. You want it to be more conversational with your client. It's not like you've memorized a checklist. Okay, I'm done with that. Now we can move on with the session. The whole session has to be conversational. It has to promote dialogue. So... The last thing you're going to ask after the limits of confidentiality is, do you have any questions? You're going to be a good client because you don't want to stress out your fellow students and say, nope, that sounds good to me. <laughs> so don't throw your partner for the loop, you know? Uh, all right. Um, so the next thing is... Uh, you can ask them, have you ever been in counseling? What was that experience like for you if they were? We're not getting into details here. Um, it's more like, yeah, I've been in counseling before. What was that experience like for you? It wasn't very good. Uh, well, I hope this is a more, I'm sorry you had a negative experience. I hope this is more positive for you. Yeah, I was in counseling and it was a great experience. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I hope this is just as positive. No, I've never been in, in counseling. Well, I commend you on taking the risk and coming to counseling, and I hope this is a positive experience. Every single answer is the same. I want them to have a positive experience. It's just the way I phrase it, depending on what they say. But we're not getting into topics or diagnoses or what they were in counseling for. The whole point of this is that I want them to have a positive experience in this counseling session. All right. Finally, after we get through all of that memorized part, we can ask them, what brought you here today? And that opens the door to their presenting problem. Now, this is the challenge. You can memorize that whole first part and it can be perfect. But this is the part you don't know how they're going to respond to you. You don't know what they're going to say. I can give you a clue. You're all graduate students. You've got jobs or graduate assistantships, families, friends, relationships, a lot of new courses. This is one of the first classes most students take. So 
You don't know what to expect. It's a different class than you've ever had before. So you're probably a little stressed out and overwhelmed being a graduate student in this class. So chances are your partner is going to say something like that. You all have something in common there. Uh, but you don't have to, you know. It's going to have to do with different domains, though, okay? So the first domain, and probably the most common one, is relationships. And there's different types of relationships. There's our family of origin that we grew up with. There's our current relationship with a significant other, if we have one, or maybe the issues that we don't have one. Or it's our psychosocial relationships, our peers, our friends, things like that. So relationships in those three categories. The second domain is academics and career, jobs and school. The third one, which we're probably not going to get into is the physical domain. I've had clients with illnesses, terminal illnesses, injuries, all kinds of things come to counseling. And um, their issue begins with physical, but they have an emotional reaction to whatever's happening physical. We probably won't get into that domain. We don't even talk about the domains. What I'm doing is you need to kind of categorize which domain they're bringing up with their presenting problem. And it's going to be one of those domains. The next thing we need to do, and this is the hardest thing. So people bring up situational problems as the presenting problem, but they it's not the real issue. It's not the underlying issue. If we run with a symptom of their issue, we'll never help them with the underlying issue. So this is the hardest part because people bring up symptoms and issues. They don't bring up underlying issues, the deeper problems. Because all of our issues, all of our problems surface with symptoms or situations. So if I have a problem with uh, a fear of failure, it might lead to perfectionism, which might lead to anxiety about an assignment I have to do. Or it might lead to me worrying about what Grafton's reaction to my tape is. But anxiety about sharing a tape is very different than a fear of failure. Fear of failure is very deep, whereas worrying about a tape is a situation. If I only addressed the situation, I would never get to the fear of failure, which will come up again. So if we don't deal with the underlying issue, it'll resurface later. Half the counselors out there deal with the situation and they, they run with that instead of digging for the deeper issue. So that's the first thing we have to do. We have to ask ourselves, is this a situation they shared with me or did they really share a deeper issue? That's what we're going to focus on in this course is getting to a deeper issue and staying there. And uh, the other big mistake that new counselors make is problem solving. When we talk with friends and families, what we normally want to do is problem solve or deal with time management or come up with a solution or let's look at all the pros and cons. We are going to do none of that. But we're so used to doing it. It's hard not to, it's hard not to problem solve. So the way we avoid problem solving 
is focusing on an emotion. So if somebody says, uh, wow, I'm really worried about a tape I'm going to show in class, and I'm wondering what the reaction is going to be and what the professor is going to say, we're going to begin using our skills. And I'm going to reflect that feeling. So you say you're feeling worried about this. Tell me more about that feeling of being worried. You're going to stay with that feeling. And that's going to avoid problem solving. And it's going to help you to get to a deeper feeling, which is connected to the deeper issue. Okay? So if people say, I'm worried, then we get them to anxiety, anxious. And the root of anxiety is usually fear, fear of something, fear of failing the class. And that usually leads to rejection, fear of rejection. Yeah. So you see how that ladder of emotions works. You can do that with any emotion. So there's kind of like secondary emotions like anger and deeper emotions like um, feeling betrayed, feeling uh, treated unfairly, uh, uh, an experience of prejudice or bias. All of those things can result in the emotion of anger. But anger is not the deeper root. Anger is just a symptom of those deeper emotions. So this is the trick. This is what we're going to work on this whole semester is getting to a deeper feeling linked to the deeper issue. And then the final part is, is this a theme in their life? So does it happen in work? Does it ha happen in academics? Does it happen in relationships? Does it happen in all the different kinds of relationships? So we're going to see if it's thematic in the different domains. All right, what we're going to skip is the assessment process. We're just going to deal with feelings and domains and deeper issues. The reason we're skipping the assessment process is because now it's included in the DSM class. So we're not going to do that. It takes up a lot of time and we can cut our tapes to 30 minutes each if we don't do the assessment process, which is fine. It's covered in the DSM class. All right, next week, we're going to go through the Rogerian skills and apply them to emotions and domains, and then we're going to practice some. All right, questions about anything we went over tonight? Any questions? Right. Yeah. So what happens if you go through the, you miss something, the confidentiality part, because I can see that happening. Um, what is the process to rectify that problem? Like if it were to come up and, you know, they use it against you. I know it's good to have insurance for that type of case, but is that the only solution or um, how do you address the issue I guess? So if you're at an agency or a private practice, it's going to be written down and they're going to sign it. Yeah. This is just like you have to memorize it in case you're in like kind of an emergency situation where you're not in your office, but you're doing some counseling and you just got to run through these really quickly. Mm -hmm. But most of the time they're going to be written down. So you're going to remember them. But there are certain things in this program you do need to memorize. You got to memorize confidentiality and limits. I would say you should probably memorize the mental status exam, like from the DSM course, um, so that you can do a quick evaluation of somebody. Like if there's an emergency and you're at the scene of a fire or a robbery and somebody's a little incoherent, you can do a mental status exam with them. And then when the, the medics arrive, the EMT, you can tell them the results of your mental status exam. It'll really cut down a lot of treatment time. So what do you do? 
I, if that actually happened, I'm honest with the client. I'm saying, I'm really sorry. I forgot to give you this limit of confidentiality. I'm honest with them. And I say, it was my error. I apologize. This is what's going to happen now. I'd ask you to be understanding. That's the best I can do. Then there's insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else? I'm curious in your experience, like how uh, like teenagers would push back, <laughs> like in the therapy situation where they're like, well, if you, my parents are going to find, I'm not going to say it, like closing up, like keeping them feel like, I don't know. I, I'm just curious what your experience has been or what you've seen or heard. Um, they really don't focus that on, on that a lot. Um, because they, they know why they're there. The parent or guardian knows they're there. They've had a long discussion about everything. Um, I think if they've got an attitude, it's bigger than that. It's anti-authority, it's anti-adult. You know, their attitude's bigger than that one limit. Yeah, so um, like uh, one time I had 16 year old uh, female client um, who I was having a really hard time building trust with and um, she was acting out in school and in foster care. And um, I could understand why, you know, she had a difficult life. And uh, so I tried empathy and, um, you know, I tried uh, talking about her interests. And uh, one time she wore like a, a Nirvana t-shirt. And that's pretty old school for a 16 year old. And I said, oh, I noticed you're wearing a Nirvana t-shirt. You must like Kurt Cobain. And, you know, she's like, yeah, what would you know about that old man? And I'm like, what was Kurt Cobain's birthday? And uh, I'm like, look it up on your phone. And then I handed her my driver's license and we were born the same year. So you got to look for opportunities like that. That's funny. I like that story. <laughs> Just got to look for opportunities. What else? All right. We are done for the night. I will see you next week. We'll, next week's important because we're going to go over all the basic skills that you're going to have to incorporate in your tape, and then we're going to practice them. All right, we'll see you later. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.